Hey fellow females! So welcome back to another episode of Faithful with Friday. In today's case, we're actually going to be discussing the Ken and Barbie killers of Canada. This is actually, I think, the first Canadian case that I've actually ever covered on this channel. So I'm actually really excited. Uh, as far as I know, I actually have another one coming up really soon. So yeah, let's just go ahead and get started. But if I lay down and I play dead and I stay dead, maybe you'll get sick of being the monster out of my head, under my bed, think you're something. Lamoka was born on May 4th, 1970 in Port Credit, Ontario, which again, that's in Canada. Um, her father was said to be a Czechoslovakian immigrant, and then her, of course, you had the mother, Dorothy. Carla was actually said to be the oldest of three daughters. Um, of course, you had Lori, then you had Tammy. Tammy, of course, will come into the story later, so remember her name. Uh, I said that at one point when she was younger, she was seen to be like very controlling and stuff. And at one point, she even said to throw a hamster out the window. And of course, the hamster ended up dying. But she had a friend like dig it up to see like how it decomposed. Uh, she was said to be popular in school though, and she he was even said to start wearing dark clothes. She apparently had lost her virginity to a guy named Doug, was saying that uh, the sex was like BDSM type of stuff, but when Doug was, Doug had to come out and say, uh, no, it was really just basic regular sex. The reason why she said apparently that, that they had um, that kind of BDSM type sex was because apparently she had a thing, for, she had dark sexual fantasies and she was into the occult. Um, when Carla turned 17, she of course started working at a pet store. On October 17, 1987, she was, she was at a pet convention with a friend, and they went to go get dinner, apparently at the hotel they were at, and then Paul and one of his friends walked in, and so they started talking to Carla, and there was an instant connection made. Of course, if you don't know who Paul is, Paul Kim Bernardo was born August 27, 1964 in Scarborough, Canada. He was actually said to be the youngest of three. Was He was a sweet child, but actually, of course, had a hard upbringing. Uh, father was accused of molestation and even said to have actually done that to his own daughter, which, of course, that's Paul's sister. Uh, he was actually said to be born with a purple mark on his face that back in the 1600s, they saw that as like a devil mark. But in reality, it was actually a blood clot due to lack of oxygen oxygen that he got while, he, while his mother was in labor. Uh, his tongue was actually said to be fixed to a part of his mouth, which, because of this, he obviously like couldn't speak, and they did not get this fixed until he was five. Hats, wait. Uh, he st suffered from stuttering and other speech impediments. He was actually bullied by his classmates, despite caring about his appearance, unlike most boys his age. When he was five. He allegedly like ran away and was not even noticed for like a couple of days. What? What's going on? Y'all are going to jail! Period! When he was eight, a mother apparently found like, her biological sister and would apparently go visit her every weekend to get away from the house because apparently she knew what was going on. So, of course, was verbally abusive to him and his siblings. When he was in his early teen years, he was actually a Boy Scout and was actually said to be very liked by the other kids' as mothers. Uh, the father, of course, was said to be abusive to his mother, often degrading her and was even said it was that was actually even said to be a peeping tom coincidence i think not uh when he was 16 he apparently found out from his mother during an argument that kenneth the person that who he got his middle name from who he thought was his dad wasn't actually his dad and that he was actually the result of an affair that his mother had you are not the father He actually was mad at his mother and so started calling her a whore, you know, all these horrible things. Um, in 1981, it's actually said that a woman named Nadine Bremer would actually dump Paul for his friend Steve after they dated for a year and he apparently gave her his virginity. Emotional dammit! This is believed to actually be the breaking point for Paul. It was actually also said that this is when he would start, like, he would even start peaking 
Like he would start being a peeking Tom like Kenneth was in his neighbor's windows. After his high school graduation, he was said to actually start working at American Way, which is basically like an M ooh, an MLM. He would uh, attend these motivational seminars to like pick up women at the bar in order to get to sleep with them. Years ago, when I was backpacking across Western Europe, Paul's mother would actually move out of the house and into an apartment to where she could be closer to her sister. Paul would um, go start in the University of Toronto starting in September of 1983 to pursue a degree in actually his favorite book was actually said to be American Psycho and in order to be a, a proper serial killer according to him you had to be charming so he was practicing to be charming. So, of course, during college, Paul was actually said to have several girlfriends, but the relationships would end up declining and, of course, come to a stop when it started getting, when the sexual part of it started getting abusive. Uh, it was said that he actually had a girlfriend, like an on and off girlfriend named Jennifer for like three years, and apparently she was like around the age of 16 and he was 22. What? What's going on? Y'all are going to jail! Period! After she graduated, he took her somewhere private and attempted to strangle her. Uh, he uh, Luckily, she survived. He, he apologizes, hoping that everything will eventually be okay. And apparently, while dating her, he was actually seeing other women on the side. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. There was also a woman named Lenore who he took to a parking lot for like punishing her after he, he found out that she wasn't a virgin when they met. Lenore actually suspected Paul of cheating, so she does like a surprise visit to his house, and of course she finds the women's shoes on the floor. She apparently breaks the window with his, breaks one of the windows with her hand, and that's like, she apparently like never contacts him again, like we never hear about Lenore again. Uh, Jennifer apparently stayed dating Paul until she th threatened to call police because of his antics. Paul was actually said to have stopped dating exclusively so he couldn't be a cheater, and apparently this is where the Scarborough rapes would start. After several attacks, another man who had nothing to do with the, um, the Scarborough rapes, he was actually arrested, tried, and convicted, even though Paul was out there still committing the rapes. And so apparently this is around the time that he met Carl. So the co-worker... Um, that Carla was with, of course, left her alone. And then the two of them were actually said to have talked for hours. They go back to Carla's room, and even though they just met, uh, they they go have sex in her. They go have sex in her room. What? What's going on? Y'all are going to jail. Period. But despite Carla being like seventeen when this happened, apparently the age of consent was sixteen. So apparently this was illegal. Like this wasn't illegal. And it was even said that she apparently made her friends watch. And then other sources say that her friends even had sex while they were having sex. But it wasn't all together. It was like, they're doing their thing. We're doing our thing. But it's all in the same room. Wait a damn minute. <laughs> Wait a damn. Uh, they soon would start dating each other afterwards. Paul and Carla, of course, started like being around with each other a lot. And when they weren't together, Paul was out raping other women, and this is believed to have actually started in the fall of 1988. Well, trying to rape him, so y'all need to hide your kids, hide your wife. On October 4th, 1988, he apparently stabbed a girl multiple times to where she, where she required stitches. DNA, DNA samples were forced taken from the victims, and the FBI would come up with, like, the profile of the person they were looking for, and it apparently matched Paul up to a T. Carla would graduate high school in 1989. After graduating, Carla had apparently told her friends that Paul was being verbally abusive. In December of that year, Paul had actually took Carla to Niagara Falls where he proposed and she obviously said yes. Uh, they planned their wedding for the spring of 1991. However, on May 29th, 1990, the police had finally released a sketch of what they believed the Scarborough Reef was to look like. And so a friend of Paul's had called the police to let them know like, hey, like that kind of looks a lot of my friend. 
And so Paul ends up getting called in because several people actually said, hey, that actually looks like him. So all of a sudden the police are going to go question it and they keep getting the same name over and over again. Paul, of course, wanted to get his DNA, um, like a DNA sample taken from him. But because this was like the 90s and DNA was kind of like relatively new and there was obviously hundreds of other samples waiting, his was like a line of waiting. I'm waiting, I'm waiting. Um, after he had his DNA t um, samples from him, he was soon moved to St. Catharines, away from Scarborough, claiming to be under the attention, living on, with Carla's family, under the attention that he was saving up money for the wedding and I guess their future house. Bullshit. Bullshit. So then, of course, all the uh, rapes that were happening in Scarborough stopped, and they all started picking up again the St. Catharines. Coincidence? I think not! Uh, when Christmas of 1990 came, Paul apparently gave Carla a teddy bear, and she gave him apparently a free coupon for free perverted act. I am disgusted. So, of course, Paul was upset that Carla was an aversion when they met. Even though when she lost her virginity, she apparently didn't even know Paul even existed. Bitch! The doll. And so, he somehow convinced her to present him with someone who was a virgin. This is when he decides that Tammy, who is Carla's younger sister, remember, the one, one of the girls I mentioned earlier, and was 15 at the time, he decided that she would actually be the best candidate for the job. What? What's going on? Y'all are going to jail! Period! So now, of course, we're getting into Tammy. Uh, Tammy Lynn Hamoko was born on January 1st, 1975. Her hobbies were actually said to be track and soccer. She apparently was flattered that Paul was giving her attention because remember he's the older guy and would apparently even joke to Carla that Paul actually liked her better, like Paul liked her being Tammy better than Carla, which of course this pissed Carla off. A month before Tammy's death, sadly, Paul would actually have Carla pretend to be Tammy, you know, like by saying her name, so she's Tammy, her age, which was 15, that she was a virgin, which as far as we know she was, and that she wanted to marry him. I am disgusted. Uh, Paul would even watch Tammy from the blinds that Carla broke just for the purpose of him being able to watch Tammy. And apparently there are several incidents, at least one confirmed, but several incidents where he would pleasure himself in the room like while she was asleep. And there was one incident where it was actually recorded. I am disgusted. Of course, Paul, if this isn't already disgusting enough, he says this isn't good enough. So, of course, Carla being in love, she steals medicine and sleeping pills from her job. Because remember, she works, she works in a vet, veterinarian place, so she has access to this stuff. And so then fast forward to, like, December 23rd, 1990. It, obviously, they're celebrating Christmas. Paul, Carla, Tammy are in the living room, and everyone else is asleep. Paul has spiked uh, Tammy's spaghetti and drinks with the pills apparently that wasn't enough so then carla took a towel of hydroclean and then put it like over her face uh, they then of course used this moment to rape tammy and of course they both ended up participating tammy of course begins to throw up and the two of course start freaking out uh they stop what they're doing call the police and then I also cleared up the evidence that anything that can incriminate them. They call the police. Tammy's taken to the hospital where she's later declared dead. Carla is said to have actually been holding her sister Lori, like the other, the third sister. And then Paul seemed to have a reaction that was very dramatic. Boy, if you don't get- uh, The police obviously looked when they noticed the burn marks around Tammy's mouth. And they knew that that was a common symptom of halophane, which remember that's the gas they used on the towel and everything. Gotcha, bitch. And so somehow the couple, the couple had the audacity to claim that that was actually rug burn from when they dragged her on the carpet trying to get her to like revive. Really, nigga. And so somehow, despite them having their suspicions, they ended up bringing Tammy's death as an accident and saying that she died of natural causes. At Tammy's funeral, they they actually put a picture of the two of them, like Paul and Carla together. There's a picture of the two of them in her casket at the funeral. And what Paul's even said to be, have been stroking her hair. Uh, Tammy would of course be buried in the St. Catherine Cemetery.
Carlos' parents did not feel comfortable with having Paul in the house after, you know, seeing what just happened to Tammy. So they were politely asked, I guess, to leave. And so they eventually ended up getting their own place. This is said to be where the abuse that Carlos was getting was seen to be physical and verbal. Because, well, I guess no one else was around. So I guess he, you know. So yeah. Uh, whenever she would say that she wanted to leave, which apparently was often, he would say that he still had the tapes proving that she was involved in her sister's death and that if he goes down, she basically goes down with him. If I'm going down, I'm taking everybody with me. This time, Paul would actually start working for an illegal cigarette smuggling business, and so this would require him to cross between U.S. and Canadian borders daily. Uh, Paul was apparently even having a little bachelor moment, and so he goes to Florida, out of all places, for their for his uh, bachelor party. He is admitting a nurse named Allison Worthington, which apparently could make Paul happy in ways that Carla couldn't. He apparently even met the family and Allison was under the assumption that Paul had actually, his sister had just died, which came on. The sister that he has, she's still alive, but he said that Tammy was his sister and yet he was living with his other sister, which was Carla. And so Carla ends up, um, you know, I guess in a desperate attempt to like try to get him back to her. She ends up befriending this girl, not Allison, but she ends up befriending like this other girl who's, who's only known as Jane Doe. And so Paul like apparently comes home from this bachelor, sorry, bachelor party. And she, and so they would, they would occasionally invite her over. They would drug her, have her way with her. She would wake up the next morning not knowing what even happened. So I guess, of course, she believed that she had drunk too much and suddenly she had just passed out. Her mom, which remember, she's a minor. So, of course, her mom, like, gets suspicious and then comes over one day. I, and it said that, like, they had tried to drug her too, which, of course, luckily they failed. And so eventually Jane Doe just stopped coming over altogether. But she does end up testifying later in the trial. On June 15th, 1991, so two weeks before Paul and Carlo get married, Paul had actually brought home 14-year-old Le Leslie Mahaffey. Carla would say that Paul was actually out that night with a six-inch knife, a cord, like, just in case. Bullshit. Bullshit. A little bit about Leslie. Leslie's mother actually had ovarian cancer when she was in her teen years, and she was told that she would actually would never be, have children. And so, luckily, uh, the doctor was actually wrong. And by some miracle, Leslie Aaron Mahaffey was actually born on June 5th, 1976. She has a younger brother named Ryan who was born like seven years after her. Uh, she was described by friends and loved ones as loving, smart, and of course stubborn with being, having dreams of being a marine biologist. When she was in her teen years, she obviously rebelled against her parents, which, you know, again, a lot of teens do that. Earlier in the year, Leslie was actually said to run away, but always kept contact during the period that she was away. On the night that Paul and Leslie um, meet each other, she was actually out with her friends out in the wooded area, and she apparently was signing her name on a tree in memory of four friends who had died the day before in a car crash. And so apparently there was like a wake for them, and so the following day was a funeral. This was like 2 o'clock in the morning, by the way, and Leslie had apparently missed her curfew, so she was obviously locked out. She called a convenience store and, like, called a friend to see if her, her mom could pick her up, and then the friend said no, and so obviously she, then she proceeds to walk back to the house. Of course, this is where Paul comes in. He gives, he basically offers her, like, a cigarette, so then she goes to the car, tries to get the cigarette, he pulls out a knife, basically gets her in said car, uh, was said to have brought her back to the house between three and four he wakes up carly to let her know that hey someone's in the house but like be quiet and so he woke her up because he wanted her he actually wanted her to join in the activities and so they of course tell they blindfold her and then they tell her hey like you know keep the blindfold on or we'll kill you and then paul had remembered that leslie had actually saw his face when he got her into the car so then of course because she saw his face she could easily identify him and tie everything back to um to him of course and so of course they ask her what she remembers she says nothing she was still telling her parents that she was just staying at a friend's house and while of course she's pleased for her life and for the opportunity to see her little brother again paul apparently pulls carla to the side and says you know like she kind of has to die carla claimed that she sedated leslie and even gave her the teddy bear that paul had gave her for christmas uh, leslie's cause of death was said to be like 
strangulation because Paul apparently had strangled her for strangled her with this cord until she seemed dead. She apparently had gas for a breath of air and then they he actually had pulled on both ends for seven minutes so that way there was no chance of survival. They then put her body in a blanket and then put her in the basement. The following day, Carlos Pants had actually came over for dinner. Carlos' mother had actually almost come across the body of Leslie. However, Paul was able to keep her out of the basement and any anything that was needed to get out of the basement, he would go get, or Carlos would go get, because Leslie's body was still down there. They then decided that the body had to be dismembered so that way it could never be found. Uh, they then, of course, decide that Leslie, like, has to be dismembered so that way her body can actually never be found. They cut up her body into 10 pieces and put, like, her remains into cement blocks. And the power saw that they used actually belonged to Paul's deceased grandfather. However, they didn't know that the, uh, the lake would go up and down. Like, the water would go up and down. Like, someone who was actually local there would. Um, Leslie was actually said to be actually been at a, was supposed to be at a funeral for one of the four friends that had passed away and she didn't show up and then she didn't even call for her birthday which her birthday was like right around the corner right around the time she was killed unfortunately on june 29th the same day that they were actually getting married a fisherman actually found the body parts of leslie police would look for the next year for the killer leslie's killer of course and then the fbi um person who who did the profile of the scarborough rapist he said there was no connection between the Scarborough rapist and Leslie's death. Uh, Paul then takes advantage of the fact that um, Tammy's friends, who came on, they're like also teenagers. Because Tammy's only been dead for like maybe six, six, seven months at this point. And so they decide to invite the friends over, drug them, and then he'll have his way with them. I am disgusted. Unfortunately, he was successful in doing this with most of them and they would have no memory of the night before. So in July 1991, Paul had apparently became obsessed with a woman named Sydney. Um, he apparently had followed the route that she took home every day. And then one day she just changed it out of nowhere. But she, instead of going to like, I guess to her house, she went to her boyfriend's house. The boyfriend, I guess, like saw Paul's car. And while he was driving away, they managed to get a partial license plate. This of course causes the police to be, Paul to be back on the police radar. However, they never end up questioning him or even make a report as to what happened. On April 16, 1992, they are driving around looking for a new victim, which unfortunately they find 15-year-old Kristen French, who was walking home from school. Kristen Dawn French was born on May 10, 1976. Carla, of course, asks for directions while holding a map, making it seem like she's lost and she doesn't know like where to go. So I guess with this being a woman, Kristen like trusts her. Paul like pushes her into the car, and then she left like one of her shoes behind, which is believed to be done on purpose so that way people knew like something was off. Her disappearance was of course being no was noted like really fast and she was last seen actually talking to a, a car that had two people in it that was a beige Camaro but Paul actually drove a gold colored Nissan which of course that basically wasted the police's time. Yeah. Um, after Kristen's disappearance they, the media like decided that Leslie's death and that Kristen's disappearance had to be connected like they were committed by the same person. Despite this FBI profiler still to make a connection despite the profiles the profiles being practically the same. What's not clicking? What's not clicking? There's times when Kristen was kept alive for several days, being assaulted on videotape before sadly being strangled. Two weeks after going missing, her body was found in a ditch in Burlington with the hair cut off in hopes that she would not be able to be identified. You are so dumb. You are really dumb. For real. Carl and Paul go try to have their last name go change to Teal, which is apparently based off a movie character who was a serial killer whose his last name was Teal. Oh my god! Wow! However, the way that it was spelled in the movie was not the way that they it was actually spelled. Here's the way that they had it, the way they went to go legally change it. And then here's the way that it was actually spelled. You are so dumb. You are really dumb. For real. Paul would even try to go get his middle name changed to Jason, which of course we all know that's the Friday the 13th killer. Really, nigga? At one point, Carla actually felt that the house was haunted. So she goes to a psychic and the psychic says that there was a spirit of a young woman that was dead, obviously. She didn't know that she was dead and she of course hated Paul. And so like, if you basically have this device, 
It basically was to like get rid of all the bad karma and the spirit should be gone within a period of about two weeks. Boy, if you don't get- Also, she would even uh, pour ammonia down the drain in hopes that she would leave, the spirit would leave. Uh, I never really saw anything after that, so I guess it was assumed that the spirits did in fact leave. In January of the following year, so now we're in 1993, Carla ended up having to go to the hospital for a severe beating that Paul had gave her. She said that she was hit with a flashlight, she had two black eyes, broken ribs, and bruising. Damn! Oh, so this is when um, Carla finally decides to leave Paul. The DNA test from when the Paul was tested for a Scarborough rape case, his finally came back and it was finally confirmed that he was in fact a Scarborough rapist and the person who was committing these crimes. Police try to have them separate to see if she could get any information out from Carla about Paul. Carla, of course, is under the impression that they're about to question her under the abuse that she just suffered from her spouse. After the interview, she actually went like to her parents' home and basically confessed everything that happened. Uh, she wanted her parents to know, like, from her instead of finding out from the public, like, exactly what happened. They, of course, tell her to get a lawyer, to what she does. She tells the lawyer everything that happens. And then Carlo apparently was granted a plea deal in order to testify against, like, Paul because she actually wanted immunity. But they were like, um, you can't get immunity. And so, but you can't get a reduced sentence if you testify against him. But then, of course, they didn't know the extent of her involvement because the tapes were not out to the public yet. And so after only being given like a week to decide, you know, was the plea deal even worth it, she obviously says yes. Uh, Carla, of course, to give like a full confession after they agreed. She was even cl claimed to actually have not been involved in any of the crimes. It was even when they walked around the house to like question, to answer any questions regarding what happened. She was said to have been wearing a school girl uniform and talking like a child basically trying to portray herself as innocent. Bitch! The doll. She would then show police like exactly how things um, happened in detail. She apparently didn't even ask like the police like where her perfume samples were and why the detectives felt it was necessary to take those. Bitch. The doll. However, it is noted that she did get upset that um, about an expensive wine glass apparently came from France because Leslie and Paul would drink out of it, and they never apparently drank out of it because it was so expensive. Oh my god! Wow! However, she, she did tell him about the they did, she did tell the police about the tapes, which apparently that's all they needed for an arrest. And so Paul would finally be arrested on February 17, 1993. Uh, apparently after 71 days, they had they still hadn't found the tapes. And so the search apparently had stopped on April 30th because they were they were only given like a three month period to look. On May 6th, Paul's lawyer was actually said to have removed the tapes from the house and the tapes apparently had showed Kristen, Leslie, and two other girls who are unknown being assaulted. He would of course be charged with two counts of manslaughter on May 18th after, you know, uh, getting a plea deal in exchange for her testimony. Later, surprisingly actually get a bail somehow and even got out on bail. So then, of course, at this point, since she took the plea deal, she had to give her testimony in order to get this plea deal. This plea deal, for obvious reasons, was obviously hidden from um, the public because there was obviously outrage regarding like where her role was in this case. Paul, the following day, Paul would actually be charged with two counts of murder, kidnapping, forcible confinement, and sexual assault. However, he would only get one charge of committing indecent acts on a human body. June 28th, 1993, Cara was basically taken to court for her part in the murders. And so the media was actually forbidden from talking about the case, even though it was like highly like well known. So this obviously angered the public. On June 6th, 1993, Carla would only get like 12 years on manslaughter charges. She originally was, only supposed to, she was actually supposed to get like 20 years, but then she got an additional two after it was revealed that she was actually involved in Tammy's death. Uh, the plea deal, of course, would anger the public later on, but of course it was supposed to be kept secret so that Paul could have a fair trial. Carla would officially file for her divorce on August 2nd, 1993. Um, so around this time, they finally like exhumed Tammy's body to find her actual cause of death. When they opened the casket, they apparently found like basically a time capsule of stuff from Paul and Carla, like a, a napkin, a wedding invitation. Remember that photo that I sent of them earlier? 
uh, ob for obvious reasons, all that was obviously removed. Uh, despite her body having decomposed, the burn mark was still visible on her face. On May 4th, Paul actually pleaded not guilty on all to all charges. Bitch. The doll. His original lawyer would eventually step down and then John Rosen would take over. Rosen only agreed to taking over for Paul if he was given several months to prepare since, since this was such a big case. Uh, the old lo lawyer would show John where the tapes were actually hidden. And so then obviously John showed those tapes to the police. Two months later, John had actually recommended that the case be moved like out of St. Catharines due to all the media attention that it was getting. The jury for this case was not actually not picked until like early May of 1995. On May 18th, 1995 paul pled not guilty and so uh once these tapes were revealed it was finally revealed to everybody like the extent of carla's actual involvement in these murders and so they said the plea deal most definitely wouldn't have happened had these tapes been surfaced sooner but because the plea deal had already been done they couldn't like reverse it and so carla was stuck with the 12 years despite her obvious involvement in the case paul <clears throat> of course would say that carla was the killer not him because he didn't start killing girls until after uh, Carla came into his life. Carla would end up testifying on June 19th, 1995. When asked about, um, like, the tapes, because remember at this point, they have already been revealed, she said that she was suffering from battered wife syndrome. Uh, the judge, for some unknown reason, decided that it was okay for the jury to watch the tapes, and the public were only allowed to hear the audio of the tapes. I am disgusted. Paul, of course, would be sentenced to life on September 1st, 1995. He would end up admitting to like 14 more rapes that apparently happened in the Scarborough area. There was an investigation done the following year to prevent what happened from obviously ever happening again. Uh, police would end up later destroying all the tapes. Carla was actually said to have had like a lesbian relationship with a woman who was claiming to get a sex change. For some reason, Carla was actually transferred to another prison and she ended up getting, having a relationship with the, another prisoner at this prison. But the one at her old prison, like, found out about the relationship and I assume cut it off. Uh, that inmate, the, the one at the first prison, after she found out, she apparently tried to go sell the, their love letters that they exchanged on eBay. And you would do it too for a check. Carla would later try to go get a degree in psychology. On June 4th, 2005, Carla was actually released from prison at the age of 35. Oh, hell no! She tried to go get a name change for obvious reasons, but again, for obvious reasons, she was turned down. In 2006, there was a movie made named Carla, which um, the character that played Donna, Laura, Laura, she plays Carla. Uh, I just said that she actually got married to her lawyer's brother and ended up having like three children with him. Bitch, I know you fucking lie! I know you fucking lie! Back in 2010, Carla actually almost had her, like, entire criminal history wiped, except uh, there was a Canadian law that passed before she got released, basically prohibiting this. So had they not passed, she would have been able to have, like, basically a clean slate. In May 2018, Paul had to go to trial for having a shake in prison. And uh, the charges were eventually dropped once it was realized, like, he's going to have life in prison, so why just add time to it? And almost two weeks later, he was actually denied parole. No ma'am. No ma'am. No ma'am. No ma'am. Uh, according to some people, as of 2020, she's actually no longer living with, with her relatives and was even seen occasionally volunteering near an elementary school. Oh, hell no! <laughs> During 2021, Paul was said to have actually tried for parole a second time and he was luckily denied. Leslie's mother says that the marriage actually cost her her the Leslie's murder had actually cost her her marriage and her teaching career. And while it's never been confirmed, there's actually a strong belief that Paul may have been responsible for the June 1990 murder of Elizabeth Bain, who apparently apparently that happened like three weeks after the last known rape attack in Scarborough. Uh, her boyfriend that she had at the time was actually questioned about it, but had actually spent eight years in jail for it. But it was um, he was ultimately released once it was determined he was innocent. Paul was obviously questioned about her death, but he never confessed to her death. So Elizabeth's death is still unsolved. They don't even know if she died, but I guess considering the amount of blood they saw, I guess it's like basically confirmed that she's dead. So yeah, that was the Ken and Barbie cases of Canada. And so I hope you enjoyed that one and I will see you fail females in the next one. Bye.